Oi, oi, it's your boy. The Georgia O'Keefe of internet beef, Jack Slack. That's, I think that's the first one I ever did way back in the day. Uh, and it's the Jack Slack podcast. And we're coming at you on Wednesday the 14th. And it's probably going to be a short one, if I'm honest, because, uh, I mean, I've been going almost an hour in the last few because it's been McGregor season. Uh, and I've been shamelessly exploiting that. Actually, not quite shamelessly. Uh, the Weasel managed to get three videos out in the space of a day all on Conor McGregor's calf kick. Like, one, Conor McGregor's calf kick. Two, it's changed my mind. Three, where it really happened. <laughs> so um, I, I don't feel too bad about doing a preview, a Filthy Casuals guide, and then a post, post view, review. But yes, the viewership probably going to go way down today because, uh, yeah, the fights this weekend, they aren't good. Um, there's a Bellator that has literally no one on it. The star on that card is Matt Mitrione, um, which you know, tells you how it is. And then there's this UFC event, which is built entirely around Islam Makachev, with a couple of other things in there, but mostly just sort of, you know, who have we got to offer fights to? And failing that, what regional prospect can we pull up from um, have, wanting to have them on the uh, Contender series? But we'll do that. We'll talk a little bit about the sumo because that's going on at the moment and it's good. And then we'll answer a couple of questions. Um, and then I'll get out of here for today. And what we're doing this week for the Patreon boys is uh, Advanced Striking 2.0, Mauricio Shogun Hua, which is going to be more of a discussion about like shooter box tactics generally, um, that era of MMA. But, you know, I'm going to touch on like the um, his UFC run, but uh, a lot of it that I'm working on at the moment is to do with striking against the guard, which... Obviously not that easy, um, actually. You know, that that was how people worked out Sakuraba back in the day. They were like, oh, he's not great at passing. If I just keep him out on his feet in front of my guard, he doesn't have a lot. And Sakuraba just sort of developed some gimmicks to look like he could do stuff from there and kick the legs a lot too. But um, actually stomping people in the head really hard, especially if they're competent. You know, the last days of Pride, if you watch like the last uh, Middleweight Grand Prix, um, Vandalay Silva versus uh, Yoshida, you know, tries to stomp him. First stomp he attempts, he gets swept off. You are giving up your leg if you try and soccer kick or stomp someone and you haven't set it up cleverly, which Shogun did. So we'll be talking about that lots. Um, anyway, let's talk about these fights this weekend. Islam Makachev versus Thiago Moises. And the return of Misha Tate is co fucking hell, co headlining with Misha Tate in 2021. Um, Islam Makachev. I said it the other day, but I think it was it was quite profound and no one really noticed it on Twitter, so I'm going to say it again, but could be what people hoped Kirill was. Kirill was a, a lad who trained with Fedor. He was Fedor and Alex's training partner since they were very young. He was a fighter at the same time as them, um, actually a little bit later than them because he, he was a little bit younger. Uh, and he was coming up and people were like, baby Fedor? Unfortunately... Being the sparring partner of choice for the best uh, heavyweight ever doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be the second best heavyweight in the world. It means that you're his punching bag. And Kirill was a punching bag. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he blew it the first time by trying to... He was going to fight um, Paul Buntello on... Uh, actually, he might, have, he might have fought him. Was it Alex who couldn't fight him? Whatever the case, failed the drug test in like his first real fight uh, and lost it too. Um, Disappeared to Russia for ages. Bellator brought him back a few months ago. Teep to the Junk was like, watch out for Kirill, he's baby Fedor, Fedor's protege. And then he gets smoked in the first round. Um, but Islam Makachev might well be what people hoped Kirill was to uh, Habib Nurmagomedov. Longtime training partner of Habib Nurmagomedov, but great fighter in his own right. And it, I, I believe he, Habib's his manager and he was Habib's nu nutritionist. So, they, you know, they've been exchanging roles and, and helping each other out for a long time. But the thing about Islam is that um, pretty much everyone, including Habib, accepts that he's a much better rounded fighter than Habib. Um, and sometimes that means like he'll float around and throw kicks and stuff um, and point fight for a bit. Goes backwards and forwards a lot more. Uh, whereas Habib is just one speed all the time, you know. <laughs> he only plays at 11, and he just goes straight after people and gets in their face. You know, Habib never kicked, and when he did, it looked shit. <laughs> Everything Habib did was to fluster people, make them make mistakes, and get on top of them. Whereas Islam Makachev really is a, a clean technician a lot of the time. 
Though he does still benefit from that overwhelming pressure on the ground. Um, probably not as effective a striker from top position is what I'd say. With Habib, you know, you, you watch him. Like, we got accustomed to watching him against the cage because that was everyone's response to Habib. They'd just go to the cage and then he'd go, oh, thanks, you're never getting up now. Um, but uh, if you see him out in the open, like bits of the uh, Michael Johnson fight and so on, guys will go to a knee shield half guard or whatever, and he'll just stand up over them and start punching down as hard as he can. And that's that was where I felt that he was a lot like Fedor, where um, Fedor would like do a, a throw by pass or whatever and hit you with a huge punch or hit the ground next to your head on a huge punch and possibly break his hand. Um, but like he'd do that or he'd go to knee on belly and swing in a big punch. And he'd do that knowing that you probably turn away or roll back to guard or whatever. And he'd just do it again. You know, you, you, you're making more work for yourself, but you are hitting hard the entire time. Whereas uh, Islam Makachev tends to be more positionally oriented, um, doesn't like giving stuff back. And you know, there was a lot of that in Habib too. You know, if you got to the fence, he was grapevining the legs. He was slowing you down and so on. But he was still like opening up and hitting you. Whereas Islam Makachev is very much more methodical, um, staying in the dominant positions and just smashing his way uh, into submissions or um, ground and pound positions. Makachev doesn't have the undefeated record of Habib. Got knocked out by Adriano uh, Martins. Adriano, Mart- uh, Adriano Martins, nothing special, to be honest, um, but a, a decent hitter. And that's just, like, that's the nature of this game, you know. I'm going to say it, and so many people, I, I might get the squiggly replies from angry, from the no-beard squad, but the same thing could have happened to... to um, Habib Nurmagomedov at any point you know Habib's record undefeated record is both I mean it's three things it's one there was a lot of padding in there he fought about nine good guys in his entire career but two um even there even if you fight bums for like 30 fights you'll probably lose at some point just because that's how unpredictable MMA is and three uh, sorry and um it shows you know how uh dominating and controlling he was that he never really gave up that opportunity and three a good deal of this is luck like, watch Habib in any of his fights. There are moments when he's exchanging with people. You can get clipped. You can get knocked out. It happens. Um, and that's really what it was with Adriano Martins. I mean, I'm not saying Adrian, uh, Adriano Martins didn't time him well. I'm just saying it was one good punch. It can happen. Doesn't really diminish. I mean, for a lot of people, no matter what Islam Makachev does from now on, if he goes on and beats like 10 top 10 fighters and defends the belt five times... Um, he's still going to be lesser than Habib because he lost a fight at one point. But um, I would say like he, ha- he has had a similar level of effectiveness to Habib in a lot of these fights. One of the interesting things from a couple of Islam's fights, which really uh, I thought was interesting um, regarding Habib as well, because while they are technically different, they do rely on the same uh, you know, tactical or, or strategy of just ap- applying pressure constantly from top position when they get guys down. Uh, and smooshing people into the fence, especially when they try and walk up, because the wall walk is the standard, at the, you know now. Um, I I was interested because Islam had a couple of fights, Nick Lentz and um, Armin Sarukian, where those guys turned off the fence rather than trying to wall walk, and they had better success as a result. You know, good guard play, or not not even good guard players, but use of good guard play. Um, it was it was using like butterfly sweeps and things like um, Sarukian used an overhook butterfly sweep to like elevate Makachev and there was no way he was turning him over Makachev was just basing out like nah mate but in the course of doing that he passed Ma- uh, Makachev off onto a high crotch attempt he tried for this sweep and then he just dived through his legs and came up on a single um it was yeah he was, there was loads of moments like that in the Sarukin fight Sarukin really interesting fighter and uh, finally getting some well, he's not even get, getting the attention now actually um but even the Davi Ramos one, Davi Ramos in the last in the late going of the fight used some K guard control or K control or whatever you want to call it, uh, underhook of the leg, knee shield in front of the chest to work effectively from the bottom against uh, Makachev. Unfortunately, it came in like the last minute of the fight, and he'd been getting boxed up for most of it. Uh, and that's you know Makachev's appeal, the the roundedness, you know. Um, and the, the thing is that he hasn't like he fought Sarukian, and that was a good close fight, and it was at short notice, so I don't give too much credence to it but he hasn't fought that many well-rounded guys you know Nick Lentz not a well-rounded guy uh, Glace and Timo definitely not well rounded in the delts but not rounded anywhere else um you know Drew Dober very much a striker so as he gets into like the, the the top 10 that'll be interesting he had that fight booked for a long time against Rafael Dos Anjos and that was very clearly like a deliberate attempt to make him look good because if you know anything about Rafael Dos Anjos he hates wrestlers 
In fact, it's not even that he hates wrestlers. He loves wrestlers. He's like, yeah, I'll wrestle with you. And then he loses <laughs> every round. Um, but expect if uh, if Makachev wins this one, expect them to try and put that together again. Because Dos Anjos is now ranked like number five in the world based off the one win over Paul Felder, um, which really should have an asterisk next to it because Paul Felder had been out for a long time, was training for a triathlon, took the fight on short notice, and then got beat up to, well, to a split decision even. Uh, and you're just kind of like, is that really top five worthy? I mean, it's, it's funny that he's now above Conor McGregor, but um, I, when I think of that division, I, I think there are guys who've done so much more in recent years than uh, Dos Anjos. But that's the thing about these rankings. The moment that you've broken the top five, it's almost impossible to like you have to lose two to lose a couple of places in the in the rankings. But Tiago Moises on the subject of rankings, Tiago Moises, unremarkable guy, fights announced, suddenly he's ranked number fifteen in the world. <laughs> you know how this works. It's the Dennis Seaver effect. Uh, when they booked Conor McGregor as deck against Dennis Seaver, it was suddenly, hey, Dennis Seaver's just snuck into the top ten off nothing. But Moises, like, doubly unimpressive because we all watched him. Uh, lose a fight to Bobby Green and win the decision. And before that, lose a fight to Michael Johnson for, um, uh, you know, just get dominated for the first round and then come out and dive on an ankle lock. <laughs> it's just, I mean, that was great, but like, you know, I'm not blown away by it. And then his last one was against Alexander Hernandez, another guy who just benefited from a big win at the right time with that Benil Dariush win. Came in at short notice uh, from the regional scene. But at least in that Hernandez fight, um, he was landing good counter combinations looking decent on the feet. Um, it, the thing was that like he still backed himself right up to the fence from the get-go. Uh, and then Hernandez, it, basically he calf-kicked him with his back to the fence. Or rather, Moises calf-kicked Hernandez while Moises' back was to the fence. Um, to the point that Hernandez changed stance. And then this was encouraging because um, Makachev's a, a southpaw. Um, Moises was just scoring his straight right constantly, uh, which is good. But Makachev probably going to use the bag leg to, to throw head kicks and things and, and keep that rear hand at home. Um, one of the things I like about Makachev, and I was going to make a little filthy casuals quickie on it, but I didn't bother in the end. He does something that Matt Lindlin did, which is throw like an overhand left and, and basically like with the wrist catch the opponent behind the neck, take the collar tie with it and throw a load of right uppercuts with his lead hand with the collar tie. Uh, something that, you know, um, Sandy Sadler used to do a lot, but... Specifically, that overhand as a, using to catch behind the head, uh, that's a Matt Linden look. It's kind of like what people used to pretend Fedor was doing with the casting punch. You remember the casting punch when that was a thing? Uh, it was like, yeah, he throws these loopy wide swings so that when the opponent moves in, he can reach across their back and throw them with like a judo throw or a sambo throw. Um, and no, that, I mean, that probably wasn't the case because what, when Fedor wanted to throw people, he threw like the right hand lead and then weaved out under their armpit and actually hit a double leg. Uh, but when he was just swinging wild and then they'd step in and grab him around the waist and then he'd throw them with a hip throw anyway. Uh, it wasn't like he was looking to pull them in. He was just throwing wide ass punches. Whereas this this one actually is like you throw it to get the grip. So that's interesting. I, I will say I haven't watched a lot of uh, Moises on the bottom. Um, I would be interested in what he can do um, with, the, with the bottom game against both Islam and Habib. It's got to be... Um, it's got to be that balance between staying off the fence and using your uh, your guard and also having the urgency to get back up. Like you, you want to create scrambles and things. You don't want still positions and control, which is part of the intrigue of Makachev versus Oliveira or even Habib versus o Oliveira because Oliveira has one of the most interesting and um, dynamic guards in the game. But I've also seen him pushed against the fence and elbowed, you know, um, by Chandler, by uh, Felder, you know, by, by a few different guys now. But yes, that's your main event, and uh, it doesn't get much better before that. <laughs> What's What else is going on? Misha Tate's fighting Marion Renew. I mean, clearly, being the vice president of one doesn't pay that well. <laughs> just, when she was pretending that she trained at the Evolve team, it was so good. They had, a, they had her on commentary, like, once. And uh, she goes, oh, oh, who's this coming down here? And, like, Chevelle's like, oh, he's your teammate from Evolve. <laughs> Like they've ever met or trained in the same building. Um, yeah, it's fucking one. But uh, do not care about this fight. Big don't care. Good stuff. Oh, the other good one is Matthias Gamrot versus um, Jeremy Stevens. Uh, Jeremy Stevens, the most overrated finisher in MMA history, probably. 
does have some awesome finishes, but Du Ho Choi and Josh Emmett back to back, before that, it was the best part of... Well, basically, he's had something like 30 fights in the UFC and he scored about four knockouts. So, um, yeah, he's big big power, but just can't ever land it. Kind of useless at cutting the ring. Um, he's also on a four-fight losing streak, which isn't great. Oh, no, there was the no contest against Yair Rodriguez, but then he lost to Yair Rodriguez after that. Um, got elbowed and knocked out by Calvin Cater in his last one. Had a couple of cancelled ones, obviously Arnold Allen. The Draco close one, where he fucking shoved him at the weigh-in while dehydrated and gave him a concussion and tried to like post that as a win. He was like, my primal boom hit him. And it, it's ridiculous that the UFC didn't fine him or um, close didn't press charges or whatever. Just utterly stupid. But yes, going back to Josh Emmett in February 2018, he hasn't won. Gam wrote me meanwhile, and it might be Matouge. Um, but yeah, Gamro, he hasn't, he, uh, he debuted in the UFC against Gurem Kutateladze, uh, and that was a good fight, but he, he lost the split decision, um, earning his first loss as a professional in the process. But then they gave him Scott Holtzman, uh, and he knocked him out, or, or um, TKO'd him in round two. Very, very interesting fighter. Um, came in almost exclusively as a grappler, learned to box honestly quite well like he had a fight against uh, against norman park oh yeah two fights against norman oh no three fights against norman park but norman park's thing obviously is competent boxing uh, as a southpaw and uh, in the in the third one gamrot was just jabbing him up and then mean mugging him it was it was incredible but the thing that i really like about gamrot like uh, he went to adcc he had a good match against Ga- uh, gary tonin unfortunately he got gary tonin in the first round of his of his bracket which is you know we always talk about that like it's unfortunate because you don't know how well he actually fitted in to the to the pecking order of the of the tournament because he he faced a guy who got into the finals um on day 1 or round 1 but that's a good little bout um but his grappling really is sharp and his wrestling is very cool. Uh, you know, it, it, we all know chain wrestling is the important thing. But the thing about chain wrestling is it's very, very tiring. So you don't see an awful lot of it. And also, like, the further off that first shot you get, the more people get discouraged. Um, whereas if you watch, uh, it, like, the fight he lost against Kuta, 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 Kuta Ladzi, whose name I'm never going to be able to say, um, the fight he lost, he uh, was still, like, he'd shoot a single, the guy sprawls back. And he, he um, changes to an arm drag on the overhooking arm as the guy's sprawling uh, and, and just runs up and ends up with like a front headlock off a failed shot. Uh, the guy is, is relentless and it's very impressive. However, his boxing is just sort of like jabbing and hanging around in front of people. Jeremy Stevens, I've said it before, but he's the, he's the kind of guy who you can beat if you are world class and you stick to a good game plan. He's the kind of guy you, you will lose to or you can lose to very easily if you are a world-class fighter, but you try and like just go go the same as ever, but you try and just like trade him or or, or stand in front of him and try and out combination him or whatever, because he's a very dangerous hitter. He's also good at stopping a takedown unless he really gets swinging. Like the fight against Frankie Edgar is a great example of that. Frankie Edgar really has to get him fighting. You know, Frankie Edgar basically has to say, "I am going to trade punches with you." Trade punches with him a couple of times, and then he's able to get the takedown because it takes some effort to get, or it took some effort for him to get uh, Stevens' mind off the takedown. And Stevens is pretty good at defending a takedown. He's also got decent cardio for a guy who swings full power all the time, always. So that'll be good. Rodolfo Vieira is back, um, having uh, embarrassed himself by getting submitted by his last opponent, despite being one of the best grapplers ever. Billy Quarantilo's around. Devison Figueiredo's little brother's here. Um, and honestly, aside from that, fuck all else going on. What was cancelled? Anything good? Oh, Max Holloway versus Yaya Rodriguez. But aside from that, no. Um, just, just not a great card. But what else have we got going on? The Sumo is still on, the July Basho. Um, it's banging. Uh, if you, if you, there's a, hang on, who, well, there's loads of guys. There's Jason Sumo channel. There's Kinta Mayama, I think, is the one that I watch. But there's loads of guys who just edit the, it, edit it down to the bouts. Like, you can watch, the, I mean, Jason's also, uh, Sumo channel does, like, um, whole bouts with him talking over the top of them and stuff but um, there are videos of just the whole day of matches in one video and it'll take you like six seven eight minutes to watch and if you skip ahead to the like the top guys you know you, you don't have to watch much at all um, like I, I called it the art of six second fighting in that article years ago uh, but it really is like it's, it's a very quick sport um, 
which is it, I mean, I've always wanted to go uh, and uh, and watch some in person, but I feel like if I've bought tickets for the day, then I, <laughs> you know, you only get to watch ten seconds of Hakuho in a- in action. Um, but then you know, it does grind people down so much. You know, everyone in in, in the tournament is injured all the time, always. Um, but as it stands, the the two to watch were always uh, Hakuho, the Yokozuna, possibly the greatest of all time. Um, certainly the most accomplished of all time in terms of actual championships won. And Teru no Fuji, who was like next in line to be the great Mongolian champion um, and then had some really bad injuries and is making a comeback now. In fact, both of them, Hakuho was also out for a couple of bashos with injuries. So it's, it's these two injured old boys coming back and they're just running through everyone. And at some point, might even be today, might be in a couple of days time, they're going to meet um, and basically... Whoever suffers a loss is probably going to lose the tournament or is going to come in second and the winner will win. And if you don't know what to watch for, I mean, go back and watch. In fact, if you want, just go back and scan through to the Terra no Fuji matches and the um, uh, Hakuho matches. But the things to look for are like Terra no Fuji is this huge powerhouse and he can pick like he'll pick people up with grips over their arms. Like uh, the other guy will have underhooks and holding on to the Mawashi, the sumo thong, and he'll grip around over the top and pick them up and just walk them out. He's 440 pounds of beef. And um, that's the other thing you notice. Like, obviously there is this uh, requirement to to have mass because mass moves mass and um, it, it makes life a lot easier. You know, it, 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 you could be the most technical wrestler in the world, but you're still going to tr- struggle if you get in with someone like Akabono, who's 6'8 and 500 pounds, if it's a, just a game of moving people. But Hakuho is solid, and Terra Fuji is also solid. They're just, they got some chub on them, but they're actually fucking athletes. Um, maybe not endurance athletes, but, you know, strong, strong dudes. And Terra Fuji actually, he's, I watched an interview with him the other day. He was like, yeah, no, I've always been diabetic, so I can't eat sweets. I just eat tons and tons of savory food to, to keep weight on. Um, and then he said that because of his injuries, he actually can't train that much anymore. So he just, he, he, so they said, well, what do you do? And he said, I've never missed, I've not missed a day in the weight room in two years or something like that. Um, so yeah, he's just staying strong. And uh, my, that's the interesting thing about him. Like Hakuho wins, most bouts are won on the Tachi Eye, the coming together. And Hakuho wins bouts there. Uh, Terra no Fuji just sort of like absorbs people. They get better grips than him because he's so slow on the Tachi Eye coming up out of the squat. Um, and then he just th- takes grips from there and throws people out. Whereas Hakaho, like, he's got a hundred different tricks off the Tachi Eye. The Tachi Eye is such a cool element that obviously doesn't exist in any other combat sport. Uh, it's that quick draw, you know. Well, maybe maybe if, if Western-style dueling were a combat sport, um, with guns, that is, you know, uh, the Old West-style dueling, um, then that would be it. But yes, you know, you put both hands down, and the moment that both Rikishi have both hands down, you go. And that's where they crash together. And Hakuho has a dozen different techniques off that. Like we talked about his forearm smash the other day when he's feeling horrible. He'll just hit someone with his forearm and um, rock him while he throws him around. But a lot of the time what he does is he comes up and he, uh, rather than straight palm striking, which is legal, he throws a little slap. And he slaps his opponent. He always uses his right hand to slap his opponent's head over his left shoulder. And he digs the uh, the grip on the belt on the underhook uh, on, on that left side. And he's done it to everyone. It's absolutely fantastic. So they're going to be meeting up soon, hopefully, um, and that will probably decide the winner. But there's another lad I really enjoyed coming up because, again, I missed a few and now I don't really know anyone <laughs> Like because my boy Kotoshi Giku's gone, Kiseno Sato's gone, you know, all these top guys. Um, but I think it's uh, Hosho Ryu is my, is my new boy. Has hit a couple of absolutely gorgeous throws in this, uh, in this tournament. But he, he uh, in his one yesterday, he did a very interesting Tachi Eye, which is uh, where you come in basically behind the top of your head uh, and put your hands in the armpits or whatever. But by coming in behind the top of the head, he hit this guy in the chest and with his back, like not quite perpendicular, not quite parallel to the floor, but, um, you know, his hips were well behind his head and this guy couldn't get the belt grips because of it or the um, the washi grip. So he's really fun. Uh, there's also a channel called Chris Sumo uh, who had a great documentary on, or a mini doc on um, Chiona Fuji. Um, who was for some reason huge here in the UK in like the 80s or whenever. But uh, if you think that like sumo, if you think sumo wrestlers had to be massive fat guys, look up Chiono, uh, Chiono Fuji because he was uh, uh, Yokozuna. He was the highest rank uh, and he, he went undefeated for 50 
matches in a row which is unbelievable because at some point like even hakuho your feet will just slip in the ring and you'll just fall onto a hand or whatever that's one of the really interesting things about sumo guys will get the two on one and rather than trying to like snap the guy down fully they'll just try and put their hand on the on the ground uh, because you're not allowed to put a hand down uh but chiyona fuji was absolutely jacked he was one of the smallest guys there but he was just solid muscle and he was also a really good thrower which i really liked like that's why i like um Hoshi Ryu, why I like Hakuho, why I like Harabe Fuji. You know, guys who aren't just looking for the push out, they'll look for the throws as well and the trips. But yes, Chris Sumo just put up a new video on Hakuho um, where it was, he was talking about what his, uh, what Hakuho's uh, PT, who just put out a book, uh, said Hakuho has been saying about like his injuries and stuff. It's really interesting. Chris Sumo, go look it up. So yeah, that'll be wrapping up probably before the next time I, I speak to you. Yes, Sunday. Um, it's a fun sport and you should get involved watch it or just check my Twitter for highlights um, still a couple of questions and then we'll get out of here for today hey Jack long time listener I've noticed you keep mentioning Tekken and it got me thinking if you were into Metal Gear through quarantine I delved into Metal Gear Solid 5 and really dig how they did the CQC and it looks to me as though it's very influenced by Judo I know the game is 6 years old at this point but still has many avid players uh, and would really love to see you if you did a CQC breakdown. Thanks from Brendan. Uh, let me try to remember the basics of CQC. I fucking love that. That was MGS3, I think, where he turns up on the mission and he gets a call, like, just before he's about to fight someone. They're like, try to remember the basics of CQC. <laughs> like, I just love the idea of going back to your corner between rounds and your coach going, try to remember the basics of throwing a fucking jab. Um, I would do that if I were a coach. <laughs> Some of these guys, Greg Hardy's coach, try to remember the basics of not being shit. Um, but CQC, I oh, I can't remember much from Metal Gear Solid Five. It's quite a while since I played it. Um, I think I trashed my PS4 and I lost my save file. And I was like, I am not going through thirty plus missions again to get what I know is a non conclusion to this game. I mean, I didn't finish it, but I know that it's not a conclusion because everyone moaned about it not being a conclusion. Um, but uh, just generally, the CQC in this series is interesting because between Metal Gear Solid Three, sorry, Two and Three, they really decided to um, you know add some hand to hand stuff because before like uh, Metal Gear Solid Two, you had a punch punch kick combination as Snake, which was punch punch jumping back round kick. Uh, and one as Raiden, which was punch, punch, kick, kick, uh, which is why I was like, Raiden's better. <laughs> Got into arguments with people over that one. But um, and the role was also awesome. Uh, if you ever did marine bowling, that was the, the bomb. Uh, you did have to load it up again every time you failed, but uh, there's a big room full of marines who you're supposed to sneak through. But if you roll into one of them, it sets off a wave where they fall into each other, and it's it's so good. Uh, someone should do that in like the Crisis Engine over like miles of in-game land but mgs3 was when they introduced like the, the idea of cqc um and by you know you could hold uh, or you could grab and hold people as a human shield i think you could do it from the front too you could turn them around um as opposed to in mgs2 where you actually had to get up behind someone first um i do remember you could like poke your knife in in their throat and be like speak and then they tell you something useless like there's rations hidden under there but he had like punch punch low kick and it was a really low kick. And, and that, I thought that was quite prescient to, uh, to what fighting would become. But yeah, he had like an Osota Gari and stuff like that. Just like basic rough house in judo. Now, I feel like they probably got a little bit more in depth with it for MGS4. Um, and I can't remember MGS5. But um, yeah, I mean, oh, and you could collar choke people. I remember that from um, MGS3. You could wing choke them, which is like a, it's a judo choke. But you, you can do it in BJJ. Uh, you just don't see it much. It's where you're on the back and you get the collar and you go under the same side arm with your arm, and you put their arm up behind their head while you're strangling them. It's like a half Nelson, but also a choke. Um, I do remember watching the mocap for that, though. I, it's always really interesting. So many of my, like, big interesting moments come from finding out who did mocap for various games. But uh, they had an actual, like, is it the Japan Defense Force or whatever it is? Uh, they have to be called that because they're like, we don't have an offensive military. But... Uh, they were doing the mocap for the, uh, I think it was MGS3. But um, close quarters combat militarily has always been an interesting idea anyway, because the very first sort of um, texts on fighting, and I love my old school martial arts texts. There's a little book um, called like a study of Chinese martial arts texts, 
which is like a, a scholarly study, which I'm working my way through. It's quite a heavy, a heavy read, but I, I love old shit like that. You know, I'm always talking about the Babishi and stuff, um, including in that article about Lydia Sobieska, Sobieska, which I will get up at some point. But the first like manuals on martial arts are military ones. And they're like, uh, is, who's the name? General something or other. He was a Chinese general. He, he'd made one of the first ones. And there's like 18 different sections all on different pole arms. And then one section on uh, bare, bare, uh, barehanded fighting. But it obviously doesn't have much importance. Even back then in hand-to-hand combat, barehanded fighting, not tremendously important. Um, or unarmed fighting, rather. Now, we know that like throwing and stuff were still important. like Because, it, um, you know, jujitsu, there's an awful lot of like romanticism and mythology about where jujitsu began. Um, you know, like arresting techniques and shit like that. Um, but... Yes, it did begin with the samurai class and um, part of that, like the idea of throwing someone so that you can pin them underfoot and stab them in the creases between their armor and stuff does seem to be pretty accurate because, you know, the point of wearing armor is so that you, you know, the opponent really has to aim or get lucky to actually hit anything good. Uh, it's, it's what I always love in those pick in those um, videos that go up of people like picking fights with motorcyclists. It's like, why would you try and fist fight someone who's wearing armor? <laughs> they're wearing all leather and a helmet that's designed to like protect them if their full body falls into the ground head first. Um, don't, maybe don't fist fight them. But yeah, as I was saying, the, you know the the idea that um, the idea of uh, mar- barehanded martial arts as like a technique or a, or a system or whatever. Um, you know, it was a small part of military training back in the day. And it's still a small part of military training now. Like anyone who goes through the military or whatever and, and trains in, whether it's Krav Maga or some for, form of military combatives, the advice is always like, don't do this. You know, <laughs> like if you're there and you're fighting someone and you don't have your gun or rifle or whatever they call it, um, you've already failed at step one. Wars aren't won in hand-to-hand combat um, anymore. And they definitely probably weren't ever won on uh, bare-handed, hand-to-hand combat. So it's never really been like a huge deal for, um, you know, the military. I, it, it's always interesting because like with Krav Maga and stuff like that, there is this like, well, the Israeli military use it. So, you know, it must be extra legit. And you're like, well, firstly, who's the Israeli military fighting? You know, mm. Um Secondly, like it's a conscription army, isn't it? So you know, so you're just getting people in, teaching them a bit of like self-defense, stay fit stuff. Uh, you know, they're not going into battle being like, I will use my gun and my Krav Maga together to win this war against people who aren't actually at war with us. Um, but both the Koreas, their armies have adopted like Taekwondo because it's a traditional thing in Korea. So they're like, yeah, we've got to be able to do it. Um, I'm sure the Thai army trains Muay Thai. You know, it, it's just. I think they probably benefit more from it in that they take a bit of a beating in training and it toughens you up a bit. Like, that's, that's probably most of it. Um, CQ, like, military CQC as an extra effective form of fighting. Yeah, not not a thing. Doesn't stop me wasting heaps of money buying, like, the dumbest shit books that I can see. Like, ooh, Krav Maga for hostage negotiation. <laughs> shit like that. I just got a library full of bollocks that I love like that. Anyway, I reckon that'll do us for today. Um, I will be back on Monday, but bef- but before then, I will be releasing um, Advanced Striking 2.0 Shogun Hua, uh, which I highly recommend you check out. If you're not a Patreon boy and you want to become a Patreon boy, become a Patreon boy. Support the podcast. Uh, in, a, in an age where everyone's crying about cancel culture when actually they just lost a sponsor or an advertiser, I don't have sponsors. <laughs> I, I don't pursue sponsors. I don't answer sponsor emails or prospective sponsor emails. I am completely independent and uh, funded by Patreon boys. If you join the Patreon and I say something extra offensive, you can cancel your Patreon subscription and in fact be more effective in cancel culture than these guys who are actually claiming to be cancelled. So there's that. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. Also, I forgot to mention, merch is back. You can get merch through the website, fightprimer.com. Um, and I will have some more interesting designs coming soon. Um, well, not even more interesting. Everyone wants the plain logo, so I will get the logo on a t-shirt and uh, have it up there soon. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Baby Fador's tits bless.